powerful woman, today is all about the fact that in God there is nothing lost. And so this video is for you if you have lost out on some things in your life and you are wondering how you can ever get to where God promised you that you would be. This video is for you if you need a reminder that in God there is nothing missing and nothing broken. Be sure to stay until the end. It will bless you. And I pray that if it does, you share a comment down below. All right, I'll see you at the end. Bye. I'm gonna be talking about nothing lost in God. And so I think this is going to be um, a blessing to a lot of people. It blessed me while I was preparing for it. I'm Shaitiria Jones and I help powerful Christian women take what they learn from the Bible and apply it to their everyday lives so that they can be successful in all that they do. I do that by helping them to overcome fear, um, to uh, receive healing and deliverance from past hurts and trauma, as well as uncovering patterns that hinder destiny. And so I am really, really excited to be here with you today. Again, if you have any questions, please be sure to put them in the comments um, and I will answer them. So we will get started. Most gracious and everlasting Father, I thank you for these, your people. I thank you for those who will catch this live and for those who are watching the replay. I ask that you bless them, oh God, that you build them up on every weak and leaning side, that you open their hearts and their minds to receive from you, oh God. Lord, that there would be a new level of understanding and appreciation for time in you and time invested in you, that in you there is nothing missing and nothing broken. We thank you that you truly are the redeemer that you have sent your son that all can be redeemed back to you and so i thank you oh god that in you there is nothing missing and in you there is nothing broken and so we give you glory we give you honor and we give you praise in jesus name amen all right so if you see me looking down i'm looking down at my wonderful notebook and my bible and so I want to talk about nothing being missing in God. So God's redemption. Redemption is defined as the action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. The action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. And so when we think of redemption generally as Christians, we think of the redemption of the cross. We think of Jesus Christ dying to redeem us from sin, um, which is great as we should think about that. And then I just wanted to give a definition of loss. So loss is to be de deprived of or cease to have or retain something, become, become unable to find something, pay means to hand over or transfer the amount due of a debt, wage, etc. to someone. So we're talking about God's redemption, nothing being lost in God. And so it's a, a, about a transaction that happened that was able to pull us back to God, so to, to save us from those things that we did even before we would ever do them. And so the story of redemption, and again, we're talking about nothing being lost in God. So um, I'm going to talk about Jesus, obviously, because he's the greatest example of redemption and we can do nothing aside from him. But then I'm going to bring it back to our everyday lives and the things that God is redeeming for us, even if we don't see his redemption working. Because in the grand scheme and the, and the greater thing, he is a God of redemption. And that means that everything he touches, he can't help but redeem it because redeeming is in his nature. And so the story of redemption begins before the worlds were framed. The story of redemption begins even before the worlds were framed. Revelation 13, 7 through 8. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 7 through 8. So this particular passage is talking about when the beast comes and during the uh, tribulation period, uh, he's going to, you know, 
uh, have people whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He's going to have these people uh, worshiping him, the beast. But it tells us in that last passage of scripture, it tells us that uh, the Book of Life of the Lamb, Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Before we ever needed to be redeemed, he was there. We're talking about nothing being lost in God. And I know um, you're probably like, okay, what does that have to do with anything? But I'm going to get there. So um, before the worlds were framed, we were redeemed because we serve a God of redemption. And if he can redeem us even before we need to be redeemed, our situations are not too big for him to redeem and he begins to show himself mighty to us in ways that we don't even know if we don't understand how to look for his redemptive power. Revelation 5 9 and they sang a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou was slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Revelation 5, 9. This particular passage tells us that he redeemed us back to God. And I, I wanna talk to you about a picture of redemption that God gave me. One day I was in my prayer closet at the time, I no longer have that, that particular prayer closet, but I was in my prayer closet and my background is in um, the grocery industry. So I am accustomed to uh, people bringing back empty bottles of water, um, beer, whatever it is, empty containers, whether they be glass, aluminum, or plastic. And God gave me this picture of redemption. And when you come in to redeem your bottles, when you come in to redeem these plastic, glass, or aluminum, they have to go into the bottle machine. And so this bottle machine takes the current state that they're in. Now, these bottles are now um, unhygienic. You don't want to drink out of them because people put cigarette butts in them. There's liquor. They've been drinking off of them. They're just disgusting, right? So uh, the, these, these bottle redemption machines were created in order to eliminate um, waste in the world. And so... Uh, we, we take these bottles and we put the plastic, the aluminum, and the glass in there, and they go through a crushing process, okay? So you got your plastic bottles that are pushed, put in there, and they are crushed. Um, no longer can liquid go in them unless you, like, reinflate them, but again, you don't really want to because they're unhygienic, they're dirty. And the aluminum... Um, and the aluminum process, they are flattened completely, so you can't put anything in them. And the glass ones, they are broken. The glass bottles, they're broken, right? So these uh, materials, these end results, the plastic, the aluminum, and the glass are then taken to um, companies who can purify them, clean them up, wash them, and then reinstate them into the environment at a better use. So sometimes you see those signs that say, I used to be a um, uh, uh, plastic bag or I used to be blah 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 they're telling you what they used to be but now they have a different story because they've been redeemed see God is in the redemption business and often we don't like the process of being crushed and we don't like the process of being broken but in order for us to be purified in order for us to go on to the story that God truly has for us redemption has to take place and so we have to get to a place where while we're being crushed and while we're being broken and while we're being washed and while we're being refined and while we are being redeemed that we appreciate what he's doing again redemption is the action of saving or being saved from see sometimes we don't know what God is saving us from because we like where we are we like being comfortable I like being comfortable and often when God pushes me in ways that I don't want to be pushed I push back but it's so important for us not to push back against God because he knows the end from the beginning. When he formed us and he breathed us into the wombs of our mothers, he knew the destiny and the plan that he had for us. And that's why before he ever breathed us into the womb of our mother to ensure that Satan wouldn't steal our destiny, which is our place in God, to ensure that he would never have the satisfaction of truly ever saying he did that thing, God said, 
um, make me a body. I will go down and I will redeem man and I will make sure that those whom you have given me, oh God, I will not lose one. See, sometimes we push back against the destiny that God has for us, not knowing all that he did for us. I mean, we know it, but do we really know it? Do we really live in it? Do we live in the place where he was literally beaten and bruised and broken for us? Blood streaming down his, his body, his face unrecognizable. I mean, as ladies, we've had our eyebrows eyebrows plucked, and we've had um, we've had uh, uh, you know some hair pulled, you know, and that hurts. You're like, ma'am, don't do that. My baby pulls my underarm hair, and I'm like, Ugh. listen, he had his beard pulled out of his face one by one by one. I know that wasn't a beautiful experience, but he did that for us to be redeemed. He did that so we could be purified. He did that so we could live in a destiny and in a place in him that we could not be taken out. And so the story of redemption is a beautiful story. It is a story of, of the cleansing and the purification of who we are so that what Christ did for us, he paid it for us. So now we don't have to pay it back. The word of God tells us that the wages of sin are death. Well, one died for all that all would be redeemed. And we are now the recipients of that redemption. We are now the recipients of the ability to sit in glory. We are now the recipients of the ability to stand and to stand when the winds of life come our way. Because they're going to come. But be of good courage because I have overcome the world. That's what Jesus told his disciples be of good courage because I have overcome the world that there is nothing that could ever come your way to shake you in such a way that you'd never be able to stand again before me except you make the decision not to stand and so today we're talking about being redeemed that in God there is nothing missing so how do we benefit from redemption I want to give you some more definitions because I, I like definitions because as God ministers and builds me up he he often makes me look up words he said i'm gonna need you to know some stuff ma'am so um sometimes we think we know what the word means and how to apply it but until we really get that word into the city of our soul it can't penetrate and operate to the level that god wants it to so i want to talk about the definition of the word reconcile Reconcile, it means to restore friendly relations between, cause to coexist in harmony, make or show to be compatible, make one account consistent with another, especially by allowing for transactions begun but not yet completed. So Jesus reconciled us back to the Father. The account that, that he had, we now have that account. We now have the same account with God that Jesus Christ had. We have been reconciled and we have been redeemed because of the greater plan in life. So we don't have to worry about what we thought was going to happen. When we are redeemed in him, he has a greater plan and a purpose. And I'm going to get to that. It blessed me because when I first read the scripture, I didn't, I didn't get it. Uh, but he ministered to me. He was like, ma'am, this is what, this is how it works. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 18. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 18. The word tells us that all things, therefore we're now new creatures. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then it says, and all things are of God. So that portion, well, it tells us that all things have become new. That is telling us that now those new things are now God things. I'm going to need you to sit with that. Those new things, those things that God made new in us, those things that he reconciled, that he redeemed, that he restored, that he, that he uh, gave back to us, they're now his things. So now we are property of Jesus Christ and he, those things that he has given us are his things property now so those new things they're his things who have reconciled us to himself by jesus christ 
and given us the ministry of reconciliation. So now the fact that we've been redeemed, we now have the responsibility to reconcile others to Christ. So we have this ministry of reconciliation. We've been reconciled. We have the ability to reconcile so that all things, these new creatures, these people that once were sinners that were not saved are now, they have a new, a, a new life, a new slate that has been cleaned and now they can walk new in God those new things. So we have the ability to have new things. We're talking about nothing being lost in God because all of us have a past. All of us have a place from which we came. All of us have trials and all of us have tribulations, but those old things are passed away and all things become new. When we, when we are in Christ and we give him our old things, we give him the ability to make them new things. And when we give him the ability to make them new things and those things become his things and he takes care of them, he does not lose any that was given to him. When Jesus Christ, he said he prayed for us. And he said to his father, he said, I haven't lost any that you gave me except the son of perdition, meaning Judas. He, Judas w uh, was never in him because, you know, he betrayed him. But he said, the, those things that you gave me, I kept them safe. See, the old things have passed away. The new things you give to Christ, those new things, he keeps them and he makes them better. In Christ, we get an upgrade. See, sometimes we like to push. And again, I'm, I get it. I, sometimes a little bit of goat rise up in me. You know, <laughs> he says we're, we're to be his sheep. But we like to sometimes... When that goat likes to come up, that old man, that old thing, that thing that we haven't yet crucified, that thing that we have not yet fully given over to God because we don't 100% trust that he knows what to do with it because we think we know better than he could ever know. But before the foundation of the world, he knew we would mess up. He knew we'd be in this place. He knew we'd need redemption and he redeemed us and he, he ensured that we would be sure in him. So those old things, the, the, those things that... Um, are not so pretty. Those things, those decisions that we didn't include him in, those things, those those attitudes we used to have. He said if we give them to him, they're going to be passed away and then he's going to make them new and then those new things he's going to use for his glory. See, sometimes we want to hold on to our stories, not understanding that God wants to use it for his glory. But if it remains a me thing, it can never be a God thing and it can never go to the next level. We're talking about all things being being made new in God, nothing being lost in God. We're talking about the fact that when we hand over a thing to the risen Savior, he can make it look like it never happened. We're talking about redemption, the cleaning up of a thing, the refining of a thing, the remaking of a thing, that in Christ, no thing is lost. God is a God who loves to restore. And so when we miss out on a blessing because of our disobedience, God patiently waits for us to repent so he can bless us. Joel 2, 12 through 27. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, Assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep before the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thy inheritance to reproach, that the heathen may rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people? Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army, 
and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part towards the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed, and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Joel 2, 12 through 27. In this passage of scripture, the children of Israel were disobedient. They turned from their wicked ways and God said, I'm going to honor you. You will no longer stink amongst the people, but I'm going to honor you in such a way that the rain that you were supposed to get that you didn't get when all of your crops died, I'm going to give it to you. That rain that you're supposed to get now because it's the season now of harvest, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you double for your trouble, even though you were disobedient. How much more for the people who are obedient unto God, who have lost some things that that he will bless you. God loves to restore to his people. He's a God who looks upon the face of his children and says, I don't want them to lose any good thing. So because I'm God and I can do what I will the way I want to, as long as my people follow my word, I'm going to institute a way to redeem them. I'm going to institute a way to restore them. I'm going to institute a way to give them everything that they will ever need when they obey me. He is a God of reconciliation. He's a God of redemption. He's a God of restoration. We're talking about nothing being missing in God. And then when we miss out on a blessing because the enemy wants to come against our destiny, God looks forward to rewarding us. He looks forward to rewarding you. He looks forward to rewarding me for sticking in with him during our trials. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11. So, even when the enemy comes against us and he wants to destroy us and he wants to steal those things that God wants for us, God will use that to make us stronger, to establish us and to strengthen us for our destinies. Job 42, 10 through 12. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand she-asses. Job 42, 10 through 12. So God blessed Job more because he stood during his affliction and he stood during his trial still trusting in God because in God there is nothing lost. Those things that we lose, God knows how to restore us in, in a way that it looks like it never happened. 
Isaiah 61, 1 through 11. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to anoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old wastes, they shall raise up the former desolation, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame ye shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Isaiah 61, 1 through 11. God is a God of redemption and he will dress us so well that those who see us around us, who know what we have gone through, will look at us and ask us if they can serve our God. They're going to want to know the God that we know because he's a God of redemption. And when the enemy comes in and tries to take from us uh, or, or, or tries to trick us or tries to cause um, harm to come to us, when we stand with God, he will bless us in such a way that it, it, it just allows blessings to overflow does God want us to expect things to be restored so restore means to bring back a previous right uh, practice customer situation and to reinstate a thing so does God want us to expect restoration and the answer is yes he wants us to expect restoration but it is important that we understand what kind of restoration we're supposed to expect second Corinthians 120. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. 2 Corinthians 1 20. So God wants us to be um restored, but he wants us to understand that the restoration that he wants to give us are of the things that he had planned for us. So when we were in sin, some things were taken from us, they were robbed from us. But now that we are in him, because all things have been made new and those new things are now his, he can now restore us so that we can be partakers of his promises, which are yea and amen. So please note that that does not mean that everything that you consider a loss will be restored. Sometimes we consider things to be a loss that God considers to be a gain. God again sees the end from the beginning so he knows that if something is removed from your life or if something is added to your life and if it's from him it's going to be a blessing and he'll be able to restore you to how you were before the foundation of the world when he wrote your book he didn't write a book about you with failure in it when the fall happened the ability for us to choose incorrectly took place 
And so we had the ability for things to be taken from us, for us to make decisions that would hinder our destiny. But when we are restored back to Jesus Christ, we have the ability to walk out our books in the fullness of what they are. So hopefully that um, that makes sense. So, um, so for example, God is not going to bring you back to a relationship that's going to damage you. He's not going to take you back to a boss who's going to berail you. He's not going to take you back to something after he has restored you, after he has rebuilt you, after he has taken you through the cleansing process. He's not going to take you back to something that was sent from hell to destroy you. Um, it would be useless for God to rebuild you just to burn you down by giving you something that is detrimental to your life. Um, I love, I love um, I, the, the industry of real estate. I love real estate investing. I love the fact that they can purchase like really dumpy homes and then be like, okay, this is where the bathroom is going to go. And this is where this is going to go. And God is the master builder. He's the master architect. So he has patterns and he has plans and he has things in heaven that we don't even know or even quite yet understand. But when he built and designed our lives, he built it with perfection in mind. He built it in such a way that he would get the glory. He built it in such a way that we would emanate him. And so in the process of restoration, when he uh, uh, cleans us up and when he, he places us back into our rightful seat at the right hand of the father next to jesus christ when he restores us we get all new fixtures like when they go into those houses and they bust out walls sometimes daddy god has to bust a wall out of your life in order to restore you sometimes daddy god has to remove uh um he uh he has to remove something sometimes he needs to totally demolish the building you ever seen those buildings that were condemned because there was so much damage there's water damage they they fire damage, just all kind of stuff. And in order to make it look so great, they had to completely demolish the whole building. Sometimes daddy God has to take an entire wrecking ball to you in order to reroute your life. God wants the very best for you. And when he says restoring, he's saying he's going to give you the best that he has to give you. He's not a God who's mediocre and he's not going to give you the seconds or the leftovers, but he will give you the very best that he has. And so um, God's adjustments in our lives will refine us. They will uh, uh, cause us to move higher in him for his glory. And so when he restores us, when he reshapes us, when he remakes us, when he rebuilds us, when he takes us from glory to glory, when he uh, demolishes those old things to bring in new things, it's a shift and it's an adjustment that's going to elevate us. God's redemption redirects our lives. Ephesians 5. 7 through 20. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is a light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, 7-20 through 20. It talks about redeeming the time, us working circumspectly um, as Christians. We have the ability when we are redirected in God, we have the ability to redeem time that was lost to us because of decisions we made in the past. We have the ability to redeem time because of who God has called us forth to be. And so we redeem our time by understanding 
that no matter what we have done in the past, it will not dictate our future if we allow those old things to be passed away and the new things to and those old things to be made new and those new things to be given to God so that we can have all that he says that we can have. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 8, 1. Because there's now no condemnation, because we have the ability to redeem the time, because we have the ability through Christ Jesus to not allow our past to derail our future, God allows even our past to help us. So those past mistakes, those past decisions that people said were going to take us out, God says not so because I'm allowing you to redeem the time. I'm allowing you to redeem the time because you are now operating in me and because you're operating in me and through me and you're allowing those new things to come to pass I'm allowing you to redeem the time so uh, we're talking about nothing being lost in God and so we do have an enemy to our redemption and to the things of redemption so Satan and his angels are the enemy of the redemption of God but the great thing is that no matter how hard they try to come against what God is doing in our lives they can't do it when we stand so the enemy works tirelessly to cause people to never see God for who he truly is and to cause people not to reach their, reach their full potential in God and occupy their destinies. Destiny is a place. When we have a destiny, the book that God wrote about us was a place that he wanted us to be in. The word of God tells us to occupy until he comes. We are to be in the place, in the territory, in that area that he gave us in order to fulfill destiny and touch the hearts and minds and lives of people around us. And so the enemy never wants us to get to that place, that place of destiny. Everybody has a destiny, a destination, a place where God wants them to be. And no devil in Hell and your past cannot hinder you from being there but we have to be able to properly apply the word of God and let it work the way he sent it forth to work when you understand redemption you understand that you have a future that cannot be eclipsed when when God was talking to me about our future is not being eclipsed. He brought before me a picture of a lunar eclipse and a picture of a solar eclipse. I remember we were little, there was a solar eclipse and we went outside um, to see the solar eclipse. We wanted to see this solar eclipse in the middle of the day and it was bright and sunny, but when the moon came over to eclipse the sun, it was as if it was nighttime. What God said is that there's no devil in hell that can eclipse our destiny to where it is so dark that we can can't see God in it. Eclipse is to overshadow or to darken. And the reason your future cannot be overshadowed is because you have a Savior who is the light. Not lowercase l-i-g-h-t, but big, bold, the light. He is the light. And since Jesus is the light and your future is in him, your future cannot be eclipsed. Your destiny cannot be eclipsed because you are in him. First John one and five. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. First John one, five. Because your future, because your destiny is in God, there's no darkness. The enemy can't eclipse it. There's no overshadowing it. There's no taking it out. That is not even an option. But you have to be willing to take the word of God and apply it to your situation and see God's perspective in all things. Acts 17, 28. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Acts 17, 28. In him, we live, we move, and we have our very being. When we live in him, we understand that nothing can eclipse us because he is the light. 
So applying God's word to your life because for us to read the word but then not apply it to our lives is not beneficial. We have to be able to take the word of God and use it like the hammer that it is to break into pieces the rock of most stubborn resistance. You're going to have mountains that come your way. You're going to have sycamore trees that come your way. You're going to have fig trees that come your way. You're going to have things that come your way that come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The enemy is a criminal. He is a criminal. And because he's a criminal, God has given us the, the law of heaven, the penal code, because in, in, in law enforcement, when you are in law enforcement, you understand that in order to arrest a criminal, they have to violate a law. And you are given the penal code, the law by which we uh, uh, say whether or not this is right or wrong. And the penal code, there are sections in there. And if you violate that section, you get the punishment associated with that section. See, the enemy came to violate our destinies and he came to violate our future. But the great news is we have the word of God and when we apply it appropriately, we can ensure that he pays us sevenfold plus his furniture. See, we as Christians have to be able to apply apply the word in such a way that we see that it works and it produces fruit in our lives. We were not meant to live and just to, to, to go through life surviving, but we were called forth to thrive. And when our perspective is on the word, who is the word, the living word, then we can shift our whole destinies and ensure that we are operating in the destiny that God has for us. So applying the word of God to your life, a Christian who understands how to get in the word is powerful. But a Christian who knows how to let the word get in them is unshakable. A Christian who knows how to apply the word to their lives is unstoppable. But a Christian who knows how to let the word apply to other people's lives, to how to let the word, which is God, apply to other people's lives is the true partaker of the divine nature of Christ. So when you are a Christian and you know how to allow the word, which is Jesus Christ, to apply you, you to other people's lives, and you are really a true partaker of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. Second Peter 1, 3 through 4. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4. So we have the ability to be partakers of the divine nature of Jesus Christ when we allow him to apply our lives. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. When we allow him to apply us to other people's lives, there's nothing that can stand in the way. But as Christians, we have to make sure that we apply the word appropriately to our situations. So I want you guys to get a piece of paper and write down those things that that criminal tried to take from you. Write down those things that you're willing to let God lead you in. Write down those things that you're willing to allow God to change your mind in so that you can live in the destiny that he has for you. God wants us to be Christians full of faith and he wants us to be full of the word and he wants us to be full of power and he wants us to be full to the level where we overflow and we're touching somebody else's lives. In God, there's nothing lost and he can redeem anything. And he's given us the, the power to redeem time. But it is not until we know how to properly apply his word that the redemption is able to take place. He's such a lovely God and he's such an amazing God. And he has given us tools and principles that we can use here in the earth realm to govern us in order to be the light that shines because the light of the world who is Jesus Christ came to live on the inside of us. So now the light lives in us and we have the ability to let that light shine so that nothing is lost in Jesus Christ. There's not one experience that you have gone through that you will not profit from. But if you don't apply it appropriately, you're going to lose out on something that God wants to bless you richly in. God wants to bless his people. He wants us to be upheld and he wants us to see his mighty hand. But when we don't know how to profit properly apply scripture to our lives, we don't get the fullness of his benefits. Um, I was talking to God about, um, or he was talking to me about 
praying his will. And he said to me, oftentimes we don't understand that we already know his will. And so we pray, God, thy will be done. But he said when Jesus Christ prayed that in the garden, Jesus knew the will of the Father because he said, hey, I know. The word of God tells us he knew all things that he would suffer. He said, I know that that is for me to suffer this death. But if I don't have to drink of this cup, don't let me. If there's another way, oh God. I would prefer not to be beaten. I would prefer not to be bruised. I would prefer not to be pierced in my side. I would prefer not to have my beard plucked out. I would prefer not to have 39 stripes on my back. I would prefer not to be spread out naked for all the world to see. I would prefer not to be in agony and pain. But, oh God, if I have to go through that in order that your name be glorified, in order that your people will be reconciled back to you, I'm willing to do it. The word tells us that if we suffer with Christ, we can reign with him. We all have a cup that we have to drink from. We all have a place of agony and a place of pain that we have to come from. But be of good courage because even though it's painful in the moment, when you look back on it, you'll see the hand of God and how he is moving and how he is shifting and how he has never left you. God forsook Jesus Christ so we didn't have to be forsaken. Christ hung on the cross forsaken so that we don't have to be. Everybody prefers not to struggle. That part of the process that brings us to the glory of God. Uh, David said that it was good that you afflicted me because then I learned how to trust you more. I was talking to God and I, I talked to him about trust and how, how do we build trust. And he said, see, sometimes people can't trust me because they're building on a broken foundation. We've learned through life how to deal with God, but God says you can't deal with with me like a mere man because I'm not a man that I should lie nor the son of man that I should repent see often we don't know how to approach God because we're we're approaching him from a broken foundation a place of brokenness where he said let's clean all this out because I'm not who you think that I am I'm not that person but I can be the great I am if you let me I can be the risen savior if you let me I can be your healer I can be your provider I can be your way maker I can be your miracle worker I can be your resurrection power if you let me and so in God there's nothing lost he wants us to know that he wants to restore to us those dreams and those plans and those visions that he gave us before the foundation of the world that he placed on the inside of us and there's a way to do that we can know his heart we can know his plan we can know his path for us uh, but we have to be willing to give up those old things we have to be willing to throw those old things away powerful woman i am so excited that you finished the video how impactful was this video for you did you find any useful information or tools that you can share with someone else if so send a tip to one of your friends to help them understand that nothing is lost in God. Powerful woman, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye.